go back to our series on Jesus' kingdom parables? Are you ready to go back to the land of... Um... Yes, thank you. Survey says yes, they are ready to go back to the land of Israel. So I wanted to share with you an audio message, a voicemail that I got yesterday from a very dear friend of mine who is um, serving his uh, second hitch in the reserves uh, right now, been called up into active duty um, in the land of Israel. We've been friends for about 15 years now. Um, I want to um, share with you something that he said back to me after watching the segment on the mustard seed and the uh, parable of the leaven. And so, guys, could you cue that up? Here's your Wave. Hebrew. <laughs> That's funny. Sunset here, not very exciting, too much clouds. I'm at the Shingimel, at the gate of the kibbutz, listening Shingimel. to your, uh, uh, to the last part of the mustard seed in between the cars coming and saying hello to me. Hello to me. I kind of ignoring them. I'm listening to you and finding myself starting to jump when you describe the leaven and the uh, and the bread and like wow so cool I liked it and I'm gonna use it sorry I'm gonna steal it from you and I'm gonna develop to my to, to my uh, to my uh, way of faith and miracles um, and I know exactly where I'm going to talk about it uh, with with people uh, thank you so much it's a gift thank you I'm gonna continue I love parables because we grew up on parables, you know, as, as Israeli kids, mashal is something that they teach us in school. Um, and and, um, and it's, it's, it's very common. I, mean, I don't know if in school today, but I think it's very common as, as part of Israeli education. Um, and uh, not, not only um, 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 uh, holy mashalim and parables, but just the way of describing things with, uh, with you know, with um, metaphor and 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 and, uh, and all of this idea of speaking about something but taking nature to talk about it, and only people that connected to the nature and knows the nature of the land understand it, and that's something Israeli kids learn today. That's really exciting. So that's what you guys are doing in this series on Jesus' parables of the kingdom, is that you're learning that world. And when you learn that world, it gives you entree. It gives you an inroad into a leg up on understanding Jesus from the perspective of his original audience, who also grew up in that same world that my friend um, was referring to grew up as children and understanding uh, the, the world of mashal or parable um, and the way that that functioned in that culture. So um, how about we do that? And by the way, since he was there on guard duty in that kibbutz and um, waving at people as they were going in and out of the gate that he was guarding, um, he's w listening to the parable of the, the mustard seed that we did together a couple of weeks ago. Um, this has the, pers has the possibility of reaching around the world. He was just a perfect example of that. And so I want to encourage you to share these with friends and family, people that you know would benefit uh, from these studies. And um, also help us out by liking us on Facebook, uh, becoming a friend, and, and uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel. You've got almost 400 since COVID started new teaching videos that are absolutely free that are right there for your use and for the use of those that are in your sphere of influence. So tonight we're going to dive back into context. And the first thing that we're going to do is a few videos, short videos, around the Sea of Galilee and specifically uh, focusing on that northern shore, this northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The first video that you're going to watch, in fact, both videos that you'll watch, starts here and looks across from the eastern side, the Golan Heights side of the Sea of Galilee, looks from the eastern side to the north shore. The first one is going to look at Capernaum, 
The second one, we're going to go back to this east shore and look across to Bethsaida. Uh, this particular location that you're going to be looking from is the area that the Bible calls Gergasa or Gerasa or Gadara. Um, you know about the Gadarene demoniac, right? And the pigs going down the slope and into the Sea of Galilee and drowning there. You've heard that story in the Bible, yes? Mark chapter 5, parallels in Matthew and Luke. And so let's take a look from Gergasa or Gerasa or Gadara, and we're going to be looking across to this north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's just important to have in your mind a visual so that you get what's going on inside of a biblical passage. And uh, we do this just to lay the groundwork for what we're going to do in the parable of the dragnet. So here we go. This white building right on the shoreline is Capernaum. Then you have the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee that we just looked at from up above on the satellite map. And now <clears throat> as the lens draws back, zooms out, we're able to see the whole north shore toward the eastern corner. And this is the plain of, uh, the plain of Bethsaida where the city of Bethsaida is. Now you see that we're these slopes, these are the slopes the pigs ran down and into the Sea of Galilee. These are also the foothills, the very bottom of the southernmost part of the Golan Heights, which is going to go in this direction toward the east. So eastern shore, northern shore. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to be at Gerasa or Gergasa or Gadara, Gadarene demoniac land, and we're going to look across and we're going to do a, a zoom in on Bethsaida and the plain of Bethsaida. So we looked at Capernaum, it's where the white building was. It's actually, uh, it was a white roof. Again, we're at Gerasa, Gergasa, Gadara, and all we're going to do now is we're going to zoom in to this flat plain on the northern shore that is called the plain of Bethsaida. Golan Heights to our right, shoreline of the eastern shoreline of the Sea of Galilee on the left. Now the plain of Bethsaida and this little clump of trees right here, that's where Bethsaida is being excavated actually by friends of mine as we speak. You can even see right here where one part of the upper Jordan River flows in, comes in through this crack in the earth's crust and comes in in circles and comes in right here and here to the Sea of Galilee. That's the primary feed for the Sea of Galilee. These are melted snows from Mount Hermon, which are almost 10,000 feet above the surface of the Sea of Galilee and about 25 miles north of the northern shoreline going north. All right, the next video that we're going to look at, as I, if I re am remembering correctly, is uh, starts right here at the bottom of this map. And this is the biblical city of Chorazin. Chorazin is mentioned twice only in the Bible, Matthew 11 and Luke 10. But evidently, Jesus had a relatively extensive ministry there because it's only a 45-minute walk uphill from Capernaum, his base of ministry. And he talks about if the many mighty works that were done in you, Chorazin, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented a long time ago. So we don't have any specific miracles recorded that Jesus did at Chorazin. But we know that he was there because he says he was there. And it's in Matthew and Luke. So let's take a look from Chorazin now, from the north, looking southward to over Capernaum, which we won't be able to see, onto the Sea of Galilee and all the way to its southern end. Uh, is anybody confused yet? I'm going to take that as a no and keep going. All right. The ruins of Chorazin that have been excavated... Here's the synagogue. This is a home that housed 150 people or so at the height of its occupation. 
And now we're seeing the Sea of Galilee come up. We're looking south here from the north shore all the way to the southern end. And here's one of the cool things about this particular video. Do you see this little bump that's back in the haze right here? That's a mountain called Mount Tabor, T-A-B-O-R, or in Hebrew, T-A-V-O-R, Tavor. And it is right next door to the Nazareth Ridge. And the Nazareth Ridge is so named because the main city on it is the city of? Boy, you guys are good mathematicians. All right, now we're going to swing around to the west side. We started on the east side at Gergesa, Gerasa, Gadara. Now we're going to be on the west side, and we're going to be looking at the areas of Mount Arbel, Mount Nitai, Plain of Gennesaret, and the area of Magdala, the home of Mary Magdalene. Is everybody ready? Okay, here we go. You are looking at the way of the sea right here, and we dealt with that the last session. This is Isaiah chapter 9, he will make glorious the way of the sea, repeated or quoted in Matthew chapter 4 and applied directly to Jesus because Jesus used this travel route to get back and forth from places like Nazareth to Capernaum, Capernaum back to Nazareth. This is Mount Arbel on the left side, Mount Nitai on the right side, and then an extinct volcano in the background called the Horns of Hattin not mentioned in the Bible. Ready? Okay, Mount Nitai, Mount Arbel, the travel route, part of the way of the sea, comes out onto the plain of Gennesaret. You see the Sea of Galilee in the background, the southern part of the Golan Heights on the horizon. And when you get a little bit closer, you can actually see caves along the face of Mount Arbel. These caves are mentioned in Josephus as a place where revolutionaries hid from Herod uh, who was trying to kill them. He eventually succeeded, unfortunately. This is the plain of Gennesaret where Jesus preached a sermon from a boat, Luke chapter 5, and Matthew chapter 14 is also healing people by means of them touching the hem of his garment. The plain of Gennesaret is also the southern part, end of it, point of it, is where you find the city of Magdala, which we'll see at the very end of the video. This is probably the longest of the videos that you're going to see tonight, so enjoy. Again, now looking east, plain of Gennesaret, now looking northeast, and this is the northern, um, there you go, Dr. Joe. This is the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee where we're going to be focusing our attention in a moment for the parable of the dragnet, Matthew chapter 13. It's right over here that you see the location of Magdala. I'm going to run it back again and stop it right there. Okay. Right in this little corner of the plain of Gennesaret is the location where Magdala or Magdala was found in 2009, totally by accident. That's usually the nature of discovery, isn't it? It's by accident. Microwave oven is one example. All right, so now we go back to that north shore. Ready for that? We're going to be looking at the area of Capernaum to Bethsaida, this little narrow sliver of the northern shore. Capernaum just off the screen to the right. Bethsaida we will see in a moment. You're looking from the north shore toward the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. We started over here at Gergesa, Gerasa, Gadara. We were on the other side just a moment at Magdala. Here you can see the upper Jordan River snaking into the Sea of Galilee in two different places. And Bethsaida is in this clump of trees right here. You have the upper Jordan River flowing into the sea as we outline with the cursor. Gigantic, mighty mississippi size river, right? Israel, unfortunately, doesn't have those. Okay, again, Bethsaida, the home of Peter and Andrew originally, 
who by the time of Jesus' ministry had moved to Capernaum. Also, in the Gospel of John, we hear about Philip and Nathaniel coming from probably uh, the city of Bethsaida. All right, so now we focus on Capernaum because this is the context in which Jesus gave the parable of the dragnet. We learned last time we were together when he gave the parables of the hidden treasure in the field and the pearl of great price. This is also the geographical context where he gave those parables. The dragnet parable is right after those two parables. So I think that it makes sense. The dragnet is going to talk about the uh, members of the kingdom. Uh, and I think that he, he's developing this because the kingdom of the heavens is of such incredible value that uh, it, it, it's, there, are, there are certain expectations of, of members of this kingdom. And so it flows right into the parable of the dragnet. So with the spaceship-shaped uh, uh, church that's built on stilts over top of the first century home and probably the bedroom of Jesus, right by the shoreline, a stone's throw from the shoreline. Here we have it from up above, and uh, I think this is a picture that you haven't seen yet. Here it has a tin roof over top of the excavated bedroom of Jesus, um, the, one of probably the first church ever in history uh, was created there out of a domestic room that was cleared of domestic vessels and furniture and what have you, plastered on the walls and on the floor. Um, only oil lamps were found in that room that was dated back to the first century. And you see how close it is to the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Another look, and this is one that you have seen, and it doesn't have the tin roof over top of the Domus Sacra or the Holy Room. All right, looking at it from the side, you can see the distance from uh, the home where Jesus lived, Peter and Andrew's home, where he healed the mother-in-law of Peter who was sick with a fever. Sure, it was not appreciated by Peter, but he got over it. The distance from the, the home to the sea. So we go to the parable of the dragnet, and I'm not talking about that one. Again, the kingdom, and the reason he says again is because he's already given two parables of the kingdom. He's given that we talked about the parable of the hidden treasure in the field and the parable of the, uh, parable of the pearl of great price. So he follows that up with, he links these together, daisy chains them together. Again, the kingdom of the heavens is like, the language of comparison, likeness, uh, um, the language of illustration, this is like this. Okay, it's a spiritual reality. It's something that is intangible, something that is sometimes unseen. Then let's take a snapshot of everyday life that everybody can relate to, can understand, can appreciate, and then draw that analogy, that comparison uh, between the one and the other. The kingdom of the heavens is like a dragnet cast into the sea. Which sea would that be? Baltic, Mediterranean, Caspian, Sea of Galilee. It's easy math. Cast into the Sea of Galilee, and he's, he's sitting there on the shore. Obviously, that's his point of reference. And gathering fish of every kind. Note that, fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach. Okay, so they're not fishing from a boat they're fishing from the beach. They're drawing the net up on the beach. Is that weird to you? It won't be by the time we're done. And they sat down and they gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad fish they threw away. So what's the difference between a good fish and a bad fish? In our world, it's going to be about size. It's going to be the, the quantity of bones. You know, you're not, not real crazy about eating a carp when you can eat a perch, a flounder, or whatever, right? 
Um, and maybe it's um, something having to do with the taste, good fish, bad fish. What do you think, guys? Think Israel. Think Jewish world. Think Jewish dietary laws. Fish that is kosher, fish that is not kosher. Doesn't have anything to do with the taste or the size or the amount of bones. The type of fish has to do with whether it qualifies to be eating according to the Torah, the law of Moses, or whether it is not allowed according to the rules laid down in the law of Moses. So the good fish they put into containers, the bad fish they threw away. Jesus says, so it will be. What's he telling a parable of? Here, he actually gives you the interpretation. We don't always get that. In fact, we don't usually get that. It's an exception to the rule where Jesus sits down with his disciples and he kind of parses the thing out for them, breaks it down and explains, here's where I'm going with this. But he does it right here. So we talked about parable. The Hebrew word for parable is mashal. Greek is parabole. That's where we get the word parable. But mashal, we showed where the th there's actually mishalim. You heard my friend referring to these words mashal and the plural mishalim. You heard the, the word, you, you, you see the word mashal in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, multiple, multiple times, more than a half dozen. All right, so he says, this is what Jesus says when he's unpacking the parable. So shall it be at the end of the age. That's when the net is drawn. When the net is drawn and the sorting comes, uh, goes on, that's the, uh, uh, a reference to the end of the age. The angels are going to come forth and they're going to take out from the wicked, uh, take out the wicked from among the righteous and will cast them into the furnace of fire and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth more to say at the end of the message. Let's uh, do a little bit of um, what's hot and what's not on the Sea of Galilee before we dive into the details of this mashal, this parabole, this parable. The Sea of Galilee, it's fed by the upper Jordan River, which is melted snow water. The Sea of Galilee is 696 feet below sea level, below sea level. That means that the Sea of Galilee is sitting down in, you could see it on these videos, kind of sitting down in, in a geological bowl created by the fact that it's in the Jordan Valley and it's an even deeper part of the Jordan Valley than normal, 696 feet below sea level. It is only 13 miles long by 7 miles wide. You saw the size of it, right? We would typically call that a lake. But Hebrew doesn't have a word for lake. And so you get this language, Sea of Galilee. 13 by 7. It is only at its deepest point 141 feet deep. Now, am I just throwing out unnecessary statistics? Actually, no. Do you remember stories in the Bible about the uh, disciples and Jesus being out on the Sea of Galilee and there being a raging storm? Well, try this out at some point. Put just a little bit of water in a bathtub and then put a bunch of water in the bathtub. Stir both up and see which gives greater wave action. It's going to be the small amount of water. So the, the, the shallower a body of water is, the more susceptible it is to incredible storm realities. I'm going to eventually show you a video of a of part of a storm. The Sea of Galilee can go from perfectly flat to 12-foot white caps in under five minutes. There are no natural beaches and no natural sandbars anywhere on or in the Sea of Galilee. Well, what does that mean? It means if you see a beach like on a traveler's guide, something uh, on TV, that you're, uh, and you see a beautiful white beach, that's imported. That's trucked in sand. It's not indigenous. The reason is that the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by um, igneous rock. It's called basalt. It comes from volcanoes. So there's a volcanic crust everywhere in this area uh, created by volcanoes that stopped erupting a long, long time ago. 
So no need to worry about that. But the bottom line is this is really hard rock, and it doesn't really break down into sand very well. So it doesn't lend itself to the creation of wonderful beaches. They would be dark anyway, not beautiful white sand to put your toesies in. And um, they also don't uh, end up giving you the kind of sand to be able to create, create sand bars. I've heard on a number of occasions and read it in commentaries, well, especially the more moderate to liberal side of New Testament commentaries, that um, the reason that Jesus was able to walk on water is because he was walking in a sandbar. That would be an even greater miracle than the Bible actually records because there aren't any. He would have had to create the sandbar to walk on it. Okay, can you give me the um, five names that the Sea of Galilee goes by in the Bible? Because it's only called the Sea of Galilee in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Nowhere else is it referred to as the Sea of Galilee. In the Old Testament, it's called the Sea of Chinnereth or the Sea of Chinneroth. There's two right there. Sea of Galilee, we've got three out of five now, guys. Can you do the other two? Luke refers to the Sea of Galilee as the Lake of Gennesaret. Remember the plain of Gennesaret? Okay, Lake of Gennesaret, and the Gospel of John calls it the, lake, the Sea of Tiberias. So five different names. They're not five different bodies of water. Is that going to help you to connect biblical events when you're reading across the Gospels? I think it will for you to be cued in on to know now that all of these different ways of referring to the Sea of Galilee are referring to the same body of water. Five different names, one sea slash lake. All right, how about if we start talking a little bit about fishing because this parable is about fishing. Would you like to know just a little bit would you like to have your, your itch scratched a little bit about how did people back in the day do fishing in the Sea of Galilee? I'll give you a hint and a good reason why it's good to know this because all of them are mentioned in the Bible. In fact, all of them are mentioned in the New Testament. In fact, all of them are mentioned in the Gospels. So everything that we can know about this world is going to position us to better understand these foundational documents. The early church fathers referred to the Gospels as, as a foundation, as like the four corners of, of every self-respecting Roman building. And so these are the foundational documents of our New Testament, consequently the foundational documents of our faith. Everything then that we can know, every investment that we can make into ourselves is going to put us in a place where we're able to better understand these most important foundational documents of the New Testament and then be able to apply those more accurately, more completely to our lives. So methods of fishing, why not? In the Gospel of Matthew, we've read this passage before, so I'm going to kind of short shrift it for you, but the uh, tax collectors, not the Roman tax collectors, the Jewish tax collectors came to Capernaum and asked Peter, uh, do you and, and your master not pay the half shekel temple tax? And the answer Peter gives is yes, of course. He had no idea, he's just talking. And he came into the house, but Jesus knew what was going on before he ever opened his mouth and he said, what do you think, Simon, referring to Peter? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs and poll tax from their sons or, or from strangers? And upon his saying from strangers, Jesus said to him, consequently, the sons are exempt. But so that we don't give offense, then go to, we should not have to pay this tax. The sons of the kingdom, the sons of the great king should be exempt. But Go, to, uh, go down into the sea. Which sea would this be? You guys are just too quick. I, I guess I should speed up. Throw, a, throw in a hook. So there you get a fishing line, hook and, and, and line. And take in the first fish that comes up. When you open up his mouth, you will find a statera. Uh, it's a small coin. Take that and give it to it. 
basically is a shekel. So half for Peter, half for Jesus. Take it to them for you and for me. Now, this sounds a little bit far-fetched, doesn't it? Uh, a coin in a fish's mouth, please. I mean, we talked about parable and we talked about, uh, we've also talked about story, narrative in the, in the New Testament and we distance those from things like legend and myth and fables and um, uh, the like. And that just sounds a little bit mythical, but there is a certain type of fish in the Sea of Galilee it's called tilapia galilea. You know about tilapia now. They're selling it at Walmart for God's sake, right? Tilapia, okay? This is in, the version of tilapia that lives in the Sea of Galilee. It has its own name because it's its own subspecies. And it's also called St. Peter's fish. And there's a reason for that. In Hebrew, it's called musht, musht. It is referred to as a mouth brooder meaning that it keeps, it, it, it attracts and protects its young by inviting them into the mother's mouth. I know that sounds weird. And, and this is like, yeah, somebody just drew that picture. That's, that's just goofy. Um, but it will keep not only uh, the young, the hatchlings, um, the, the minnows, it'll also keep its eggs in its own mouth. Say, yeah, right when monkeys fly out of some certain location. Seeing is believing, y'all. As they say on Christian TV, receive it or not. You see the, the, the baby fish going in and out of this mother's mouth here and here and here and here. And yes, I said even eggs. For fishermen, probably not gross, right? Mother fish to be baby fish, eggs, eggs, eggs in the mouth of the mother. This one is really interesting because the mother is brooding, mouth brooding, both unhatched eggs and already hatched eggs. You've got minnows here and eggs in the mouth of the same mother. Is that fascinating to you? Well, the question is, how would any self-respecting egg or self-respecting baby fish recently hatched take the chance of going into the mouth of a much bigger fish? These fish are known to swallow shiny objects like... Um, Thank you. What do you think? Seeing's believing? Picture paints a thousand words or weirds? All right. So there you have it. Throw your net, throw your hook into the sea and catch a fish. The first one, look in its mouth, there'll be a coin there. Jesus is not just dreaming this stuff up. This is real stuff that has been documented by photography, even in our day. Feel free to check the internet. It's one of Al Gore's greatest inventions. All right. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is walking along the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he sees fishermen casting a net into the sea. These fishermen end up being Peter and Andrew. They are not fishing with a fishing line and a hook. They're not using another, any other method that we'll talk about in just a moment, but they're using a cast net. It's round. It's thrown into the sea, and fish are caught by their gills in the net, and then it's pulled in by the fishermen. There's also the type of net that is called the trammel net. The trammel net is interesting because it has pieces of wood or cork at the top that make the top float while you have stones at the bottom with holes that have been bored into them that are used as sinkers to make the bottom of the net sink down. So you've got a wall. The net is, is, has created a wall in the water and can then be moved in the water in the direction of 
fish that are so badly wanting to be caught. Have you ever noticed that pictures of fish always show the, the fish smiling? Catch me, catch me. They're so excited. It's so weird. I guess that's why I never had a um, career in fine arts, guys. You know, like on that side of the campus, they, 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 they kept us relegated over there to the other side of the campus in biblical studies. All right, so this is a trammel net. Trammel nets typically require, catch it, two boats. One boat to feed out the line and then to keep moving and to cinch it together. The other boat to station itself in the middle with a light. Think about this first century style. No electricity, right? Don't have any Coleman lanterns and that kind of thing. So keep your thinking hats on. So these two people are, these two boats are working together. Eventually, that trammel net is, it, it, it turned into, it, it creates a, a huge circle, and then it is cinched together in this way, and fish are caught. Here's an example of the trammel net. It, this story is not in Matthew or Luke. There's a kind of a sort of a similar story going on in John 21, I believe, but no Matthew and, Luke, uh, Matthew and Mark on this. It's only in Luke 5. While the multitudes were pressing around him, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. You see why it's important to know that that's one of the, how many names for the Sea of Galilee? Five names, Sea of Galilee, Lake of Gennesaret. That's unique to Luke. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. There's a reason that that, that that detail is put into the story, two boats, because the story that's going to be told then is about trammel net fishing that require one stationed in the middle and the other to do the circling with the net. Saw two boats at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out and they were washing their nets. He said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night. So they're fishing at, when you are working in the dark, you would typically need some source of light. Yes, that's the reason for the, the light, okay? We were, we were trying to attract fish with that light, especially sardines are attracted by light. But it's your booth, caught nothing, but we'll let the nets down again. So they did this and they enclosed. Do you see that verb? They enclosed. They're not throwing the net in. They're not, not putting a hook in. They're trapping by cinching a net together. They enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break and they signaled to their partners in. Come on, guys. Cha-ching. Don't you love it when a plan comes together? Remember A-Team and Hannibal with a big fat cigar? They signaled their partners in the other boat, two boats working together in tandem for them to come and help. And so they came and they filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. This is such a cool story that we learn about in children's and kids church, right? Vacation Bible school. Well, this is the reality of Jesus' world. Now we come to another type of net. Here is one of those types of trammel nets. This is the best picture that I could find. I apologize. I went to the IAA website, Israel Antiquities Authority official website, and I looked through literally hundreds and hundreds of pictures to try to find a better or more updated picture of this net was found that dates back into the first century and was used into the second century AD. So this is not something that I picked up at Bass Pro. I did find a few pieces of net and these all date back to late first, early second century AD. But that's the best I could do, so sorry, fire me. Here are pictures of those stone weights that were used, sinkers, to make the bottom of the net um, to um, sink down into the water, drag the bottom in some cases. I found a bunch of these. When I take students to Israel, I show them what to look for, and students find those as well. So with respect to these boats, I guess if you want to know, you said you did, you want to know about fishing on the Sea of Galilee. You also want to know about boats on the Sea of Galilee. True or false? 
Okay. This is all that we had. It comes from a mosaic floor. See the little tiny pieces of rock differently colored so that it can make geometric designs and also um, designs of actual physical realities in our world like a boat. And you see three oars, one on each side. That means you have six oarmen. The other three would be on the other side. You have the boat, which is very small because you see you have one, two, three people. This boat is only going to be able to carry about eight people safely. And you also have the mast and the cross member, uh, and you've got some ropes hanging down. This was all that we had from the first century until, until there was a drought in 19, late 1985, 1986. I was there when this discovery took place. Some kibbutzniks, some members of a local kibbutz called Kibbutznof Genesar, on the plain of Gennesaret, on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee, were walking along the shoreline during this drought. The Sea of Galilee had receded something like six feet, two meters, and they saw the outline of the hull of a boat. They called in archaeologists, and immediately on the, on the bottom of the lake that's usually covered up by water, they began finding handmade nails. Eventually, they began to excavate the boat, and they found artifacts like this oil lamp, burns olive oil. There's a wick that goes in here. This part is the reservoir that holds the, the oil, combustible fuel. And so these fishermen were evidently fishing at night, and because they were fishing at night, they needed some light, and that's exactly what we see in the Gospels, and, what, uh, what, and the uh, technique that's being used to attract sardines even today. Now we have a, a deep pit. You can see there's the top of the ground right there, and they have excavated almost the entire boat here. You can see the ribs that hold the side planks together. Now they case it, uh, encase it in polyurethane to protect it from falling apart when they're uh, going to try to move it. You see the Sea of Galilee behind, don't you? And the southern Golan Heights in the background. You get a perspective on the size that the boat was because you can see people's bodies around it. And then they begin to move it by crane over into the Sea of Galilee. And for the first time in 2,000 years, because this is a first century boat, Radiocarbon dating of the, of, the, of the biodegradable material, the wood that the boat is made of, demonstrated very clearly, as also the pottery and other things, that this is a first century boat. First time in 2,000 years, this thing is floating on the Sea of Galilee. Amazing. Is this amazing? Never dreamed we would have anything like this. After being in a, a vat of preservation, some kind of... Um, substance they, uh, for three and a half years. It is now fully preserved, and it is in the Yigal Alon Museum at Kibbutz Nof Genesar. This is one of my groups there in, in the background. Is this not really cool? This is the kind of boat. They actually call it the Jesus boat. Uh, this is a boat like the, the, the disciples of Jesus would use, that like Jesus would have uh, ridden in on the Sea of Galilee. No, more, no longer do we have to conjecture. Well, what did boats look like? Or how big were they? This boat is 27 feet long, 25 feet long, 25 and a half feet long. It'll only hold safely about eight people, three on each side to row, one guiding and the other uh, doing, the, uh, doing the driving in the back. Amazing. See, again, the... Um, ribs holding the side planks together. When the Bible says that Jesus was in the back of the boat asleep on the cushion, that was because Jesus was completely worn out. Can you imagine those ribs digging into your ribs? And, can, and that's the reason why in the Gospel of Mark it says that they had a cushion there. They're sh at night, fishing at night, and they're, and they're working in shifts, some sleeping, some working. Here's a reconstruction of what the Jesus boat or Galilee boat would have looked like uh, when it was in operation. Fascinating that we can know this stuff, isn't it? 
So back to the parable. Again, the kingdom of the heavens is like a dragnet that is cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. When it was filled, they drew it up on the beach. They sat there. They counted. Uh, they, they gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad fish they threw away. Here's a picture from an Egyptian tomb that goes back 16 centuries before Jesus, a millennium and a half plus before Jesus was born. This was painted on an Egyptian tomb. And what does it show? It shows one group of workers. It shows another group of workers. And then a guy standing in the middle who's kind of the steward or sort of the, the boss who's sort of orchestrating their efforts. And they're pulling on two lines in trapping fish that, look at this, have weights on the bottom of the net. This is sane fishing. S-E-I-N-E, -E, sane fishing. Turned around the right way and looking from up above, you have a group of people on one side, end of the rope, a group of people on the other end of the rope, and they're pulling these, uh, this net toward the beach. And look at that. Yes, the fish all have happy smiles. We're so happy we're being caught. I can't wait to get eaten. Here's a picture from the late 1930s or early 1940s. And this is on the east side where we started our videos. This is near Kibbutz Ein Gev on the east side. And this is a dragnet. Remember the parable is about a dragnet, right? Jesus told a parable about a dragnet that was cast into the sea. These guys are pulling on one end of that dragnet. Here's the, the whole guacamole. You got guys pulling on one side, guys pulling on the other side, and the net being pulled toward the shore. This is also from the late 1930s or, late, or, or early 1940s. And look at this. There's Mount Arbel in the distance. How about that? And the plain of Gennesaret. These are all old friends to you now. See how far you've come, how familiar you are with this world that Jesus and his listeners both took for granted. They just assumed that we know these stuff, these things, and now we do. How neat is that? All right, another picture. It says, and I'm extracting parts of the parable now. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach. This is the, the, the end game. This is where it all ends when the sane net is, uh, the drag net is pulled up onto the beach. That's when the sorting takes place. They gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. Here's an example of they gathered the good fish into containers. Those are tilapia. Okay, it's a plastic container, sorry. Uh, I'm not that old. I wasn't back there in the day, so I don't have an ancient container full of fresh fish. This is the best that I could do. It actually looks like a milk crate to me, okay? Um, I'm sure it's kosher, though. So tilapia. Here's a, a single tilapia close up. This is one of the mouth brooders, right, that has both eggs as well as hatchlings inside the mouth, attracted by a shiny object oftentimes. And then there it is, fully prepared, with head intact, and this is the way it's served in the land of Israel. So see what you have to look forward to? It'll only set you back about $20. That's with all of the fixings. We'll try to get the drink included, yes. That is as opposed to the... The bad they threw away. Yes, there are catfish in the Sea of Galilee, or if you want to prefer, the Lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Tiberias or any of the other names that the Bible calls the Sea of Galilee. You say, well, what is, what is a non-kosher fish doing in a kosher sea? Look, it's an equal opportunity offender. It, it's not the catfish's fault that they end up in the Sea of Galilee. They just happen to not be edible by pe people who keep kosher. 
biblical or rabbinic kosher. So we have catfish. Yes, the Sea of Galilee has also has catfish. That's what the Bible is referring to as the bad. It's not about taste, size, amount of bones, or, or, or any such thing. It's all about is it biblically acceptable to eat or is it not biblically acceptable to eat? This is Jesus talking in his world. This is the language of Jewish fishermen and other inhabitants that ate the fish that the fishermen caught on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Are you literally sitting there listening to the words of the Master now? Have you positioned yourself in a place to be able to hear these words with the freshness that they were given and to understand in a way that the original participants in the story would have understood? Well, in the world of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus is not creating this kind of language. You hear in Ecclesiastes about fish caught in a treacherous net, and the sons of men are ensnared at an evil or a bad, a difficult time. This is the end, this is the end of time, and this is the final judgment. That, and that's the way that the rabbis interpreted that passage as well. In the book of Ezekiel, God is going to judge Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and put hooks in his jaws. This is about fishing as, as a metaphor for judgment. And again, in Ezekiel, I'm going to lift these people out with my net and cast you into the open field. It's a picture of judgment. In Habakkuk, you, get, you made men like the fish of the sea. The Babylonians drag them away with their net and gather them together in their fishing net, and they slay the nations without sparing. Another picture of judgment. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, my, you made my lodging with many fishermen. They spread the net. They go hunting for the sons of iniquity, and there you established me for the judgment. In Jeremiah 16, it's a little bit different take in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah says that God is going to reconstitute the people of Israel who were taken into Babylonian captivity, who had been in exile for 70 years. He's going to stretch his arm out and he's going to bring them back. He's going to restore them, look at the bottom, to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. How is he going to do this? Jeremiah tells us in the next verse, I am going to send many fishermen for them, and they will fish for them. And afterward, that Jesus interprets this as afterward, and this is at the end, at the final judgment, then I'm going to send hunters. So fishermen to gather them and restore them, hunters to gather them for final judgment. That's, I think, the way that Jesus understood this. I flesh this out more completely in my article there. Feel free to take a picture of this with your cell phone while I stall for time of which I have none. So if you have a greater interest in pursuing that whole matter of Jesus choosing fishermen instead of fellow carpenters or more plentiful farmers, then feel free to pursue that. In the world of the rabbis, you get, uh, with regard to the Abramas fish, it's permitted to eat it, despite the fact that it's a small fish and usually caught in a net with similar non-kosher fish. The rabbis know about this world just like Jesus does. They know about in the Sea of Galilee that there are fish that are acceptable and are not acceptable to eat, and sometimes you catch both, which means that what? You have to sort them out. I've mentioned that I would give you a slide with this. Feel free to use your phone at this point because this is where you can find all of early rabbinic literature online on your cell phone when you're riding down the road um, when your wife or husband has already fallen asleep and it's dark in the room and you've got your phone still running, you can be loading up on good early rabbinic literature, the material from the early rabbis, safaria.org. Here's another text from the rabbis. So yes, there's literal catching of both and then sorting of the good and the bad, but also in Avot de Rabbi Natan, it says a, a net is spread for all living beings and there was going to be the judgment of the wicked. You see how he, he's using it in the form of parable, of metaphor. And the righteous are going to accrue credit. So you've got the separation of the wicked and the righteous and it's pictured within the framework of a fishing net. 
So Jesus is not talking over people's heads or talking past them. He's speaking them to them in a way that they read in their Bible and that their contemporary leaders, the early rabbis, are also speaking to them. Jesus is a man of his world. He's also a master communicator, an amazing teller of parables, and an, an incredible deliverer of spiritual reality, of truth. So will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and they'll take the wicked from the righteous and will cast them, the wicked, into the furnace of fire and there there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This sounds really harsh, doesn't it? Because we're living in a world where everybody gets a trophy and everybody has to win. And, you know, according to uh, books that are written, love wins and everybody's going to end up saved. One big happy family at the end. That's a world that Jesus knows nothing of, though. He's too steeped in his own tradition and his own Hebrew Bible, the world of the, uh, of the Old Testament, and he knows that there are both righteous and wicked and that there will be a day of reckoning and there will be an end of the age and there will be a day in which there is a sorting of the wicked and the righteous. Jesus talks about this not only here in the parable of the dragnet, he talks about it in the sorting of wheat from tares, he talks about it in the sorting out of the wise virgins versus the foolish virgins. He talks about it in the, the, the story of the good servants and the wicked servants and the wedding feast where some people are let in and other people are cast into outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. Over and over and over, Jesus revisits this reality. And so while it, would, it, it just feels so much better to say, you know what, I'm okay, you're okay. You know, we can just agree to disagree and we can all be one big happy family. And, you know, ultimately some kind of way in God's mercy and his graciousness, we all ultimately find our way to heaven. Uh, I wish that, that that was the case. But from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Moses to Jesus to Paul to John the Revelator, from, from Genesis to Revelation, the reality is that we are all facing not only our, our own personal end, our own personal demise, our own physical death, but we're also facing a moment in time where time is no more and God intervenes and the wicked are separated from the righteous, the wheat from the tares, the wise and the foolish virgins, the, the, the good and the wicked servants, those that are accepted into the wedding feast and those who are not allowed into and are actually cast out of the wedding feast. That's a reality that Jesus knew very well, and he took many pains to drill down on that reality in multiple instances, not just this parable of the dragnet. It's a reality. It's as much a reality as, as our own personal physical death. So, hey, could we just covenant together that we're going to make the cut? Why not? How about if we also covenant together to take as many along with us as we can? Let's, let's increase the number of, this is what you guys are all about in missions, and this is what we're about is the kingdom of the heavens, the body of Christ, uh, the, God's kingdom members. Let's maximize the, the amount of wheat and minimize the number of tares, the good fish as opposed to the bad fish. Maximize the wise virgins versus the foolish ones, the good servants versus the wicked ones, the people who are allowed in, the people who are cast out of the wedding feast. Let's maximize that number. Would you stand with me? Pastor Joe, anybody want to help conclude? I think I'm on my own on this. All right, let's pray. God, by all means, empower us to live the way you've called us to live. Walk the way you've called us to walk. Die to self and obey your word. Obey your spirit. Lord, enable us to reach out and to touch as many people as we can so that there'd be more wheat in the barns and less tares to burn up. So that there's more good fish and fewer fish that are rejected. Lord God, work through us. Work in us first and then work through us. By all means, Lord God, we are determined 
We drive our, uh, our stake in the, in the ground and we say, we are going to make the cut with your help, with your empowerment. And Lord God, help us to maximize the time and the opportunities that we have to bring as many into the storehouse, as many into the kingdom of the heavens as we possibly can. And we want to give you praise. We give you thanks for being that we are members of such an, in, uh, an incredible kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for these parables. We thank you for the parable of the dragnet. We are reminded, Lord, that the time is short, the labors are few. But, Lord, send us out into your harvest, and we will give you the praise and the honor. In Jesus' awesome name, amen.